Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Tom Hanks has worn a lot of hats in Hollywood, actor, director, producer. Well, now he can add novelist to his extensive resume. His debut is about, what else? Making movies. Ben Mankiewicz went behind the scenes with him on the Paramount studio lot. Once you're on the lot, you can walk around. You can go almost anywhere. I'm going to yeah. tell you something right yeah. now, and don't, don't put this on. Of course, keep it on. There are signs that are always around sound stages. As, this is a close set. Nonsense. <laughs> Anybody can walk onto any set anytime they want to. No one is going to say, hey, you, yeah. come back here. Later in the show, Tom Hanks gets lucky. This is my, one of the great memories I have. What was, what's five dollar? Five dollar bucket Fridays, everybody puts five bucks, you sign your name to a five dollar bill and stick it in the bucket. Mm -hmm. And then it's collected, and sometimes it's like 800 bucks in there, right? Sometimes. And at the end of the day, at the end of wrap on Friday, somebody reaches in, pulls it out, and it's always either a Teamster, <laughs> or one of the PAs, because a lot of, you know, yeah, a lot right. of people that. And one day I, I took off and I was getting myself, and all of a sudden one of the PAs was knocking on the door of my truck. Tom, Tom, you won the $5 bucket! Then, for a restaurant, there is no greater honor than receiving a Michelin star. But the ratings that foodies swear by actually started as a way to promote car tire sales. Califasane has the story. You still sell tires? We do. But the one uh, making the tires are not the, the professional anonymous inspectors eating out in the restaurants every day. The Michelin Guide, first published in 1900, began awarding stars to restaurants in France about a hundred years ago. The uh, founding brothers, Frère Michelin, had uh, this brilliant idea to have a guide to help uh, the people uh, travel. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. You might say Tom Hanks is adding a new chapter to his four decades long career. He's trying his hand at being a novelist with a subject he knows a thing or two about, making a Hollywood blockbuster. Here's Ben Mankiewicz. Where are we right now? Uh, we are on, okay, we are on about as famous a back lot as you're going to get. They moved some- Just another ho-hum day in Hollywood. A tour of Paramount Studios with Tom Hanks. It looks real. It's impossible to believe that uh, these aren't real. Take your hands and just block off the sky, you know, right. so it, you know. Right. And honestly, that's a city street. Today, he's revealing some show business truths. Once you're on the lot, you can walk around. You can go almost anywhere. I'm going to yeah. tell you something right yeah. now, and don't, don't put this on. Of course, keep it on. There are signs that are always around sound stages. As, this is a close set. Nonsense. <laughs> Anybody can walk onto any set anytime they want to. No one is going to say, hey, you, yeah. come back here. Hanks took me to Soundstage 25. It looms large in his history. Oh, my Lord, look at this. This is where Hanks taped Bosom Buddies with his co-star, Peter Scolari. The show ran just two seasons. Peter and I had the first two dressing rooms right next to the hair and makeup thing. Bosom Buddies going off the air was not, a, was not because you were going on to bigger and better things. No, no, we no. got fired. You got fired? Yeah, we got, we got fired. Since losing that gig, things have improved. He's now a two-time Best Actor Oscar winner, a producer, director, one of the two or three defining stars of his era. And 43 years after his first film, he knows the audience. Movies are this one-on-one -on -one relationship. Movies are made for one person and one person only, and that's the person that is, that is viewing. We all have our own memories that are connected to a specific film that if we think about it, we can remember where we were, what theater we saw it in, or maybe what weekend it was when we happened to see them on TV. It's like as personal as reading a book. Now, Hanks is combining the two with his first novel, the making of another major motion picture masterpiece. And action, Tom. When I was born, my mama named me Forrest Gump. It's the story of the process, often spectacularly messy, of bringing a movie from the page to the screen. I had never read a book that captured the movie making experience as I experienced making a movie. Hanks' novel tells an epic story from actors and agents 
to teamsters and gaffers. I think anybody who works in an office or on a construction site, even just a supermarket, might think that the efforts that they put into their job are as far removed from what goes into the making of a motion picture. It's actually much the same. Who causes a problem? Who's got, who's got an interesting idea? Who can make things happen a little faster? The end result is just different because you get a movie at the end of it. Getting a movie completed well, says Hanks, means following the text, which is much more than merely the script. And by text, I don't mean not just your dialogue, but the entire movie. Because actors always get, are you going to be in here? Are you going to get a shot? Where's the camera going to be? What's the shot going to be? Dude, just behave, all right? And everybody else will, will make that happen. Because otherwise, all your, all your performances end up looking something like this. <laughs> you know, it's like, dude, no one turns and looks that way at the horizon. No, 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 no. This is what I used to do. I'd go in the mirror and I'd say, oh, here's what I want to do with it. Here's what I want to do with this scene. I want to go like this. Here's what I want to do. You know, oh my God, could something be more, more, more artificial? Than, no, but than I tell that. you, I'm sitting here next to it. I'm like, that's pretty good. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, right. The novel is, of course, a work of fiction, but the stories are inspired by Hanks's experiences on roughly 100 movies, including an early hit, Splash, directed by Ron Howard. I was incredibly intimidated because I'd been on two years doing Booz and Buddies, in which our whole job was to be funny. Our whole job was to be flashy, say funny things in a funny way. Splash had two legendarily funny cast members, Eugene Levy and John Candy. Do you think we're gonna steal the mermaid? What are we gonna do, fold her in half and put her in a briefcase? I operated from a place of, here's what my job is, to be as funny as these guys. And it was not a great read through. And Ron Howard, my boss, came up to me and said, I know what you're trying to do. I know, I know what you're trying to do, and you can't. You can't do that, Tom. We won't have a movie. He literally said, we won't have a movie if you do that. And I thought I was going to get fired that movie. He said, your job is not to be as funny as John and Eugene. Your job is to love the girl. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and that, that penetrated. Like, you heard that. Oh, dear. Yeah. Um, it ended up being part of a lo the first lesson in an ongoing uh, you know, <laughs> doctorate in understanding what the movie is, of knowing the text. The funny thing is, it delivered a million passengers over 40 years in the air. Everybody involved in a movie, from the director to production assistants, has a job. As an art form, it's entirely collaborative, a word that gets Hanks thinking about his old friend Nora Ephron who wrote and directed Sleepless in Seattle. Aren't you going to read any of these? No, because this is not how it's done. I'd much rather just see somebody I like and get a feeling about them. I was cranky. Why were you cranky? Without realizing it, I was cranky because she was a woman writing for a man. Now, how often has that been the opposite, a man writing for a woman? It's, Thousands. you know, it's millions of right. times. Eventually, I came around. The problem with this, Nora, is, <laughs> is that you're a chick and I'm a dude and dudes don't think that way in these circumstances. And she says, well, how do men think in that circumstance then? I said, he wouldn't say that. He said, diddle be ba diddle di da ka da da ba da da And she said, well, let's put that in the movie then. <laughs> and that had never happened before. It happened in ways, but never as specific as this, because she and Delia literally took what I said and put it in the movie. And then afterwards, I said, I was, you know, that actually worked out great. She says, well, you wrote that. I said, no, I didn't write that. I just complained, <laughs> and you guys wrote it down. She says, that's what writing is. Down there was, there was Taxi, Laverne and Shirley, and Happy Days. And so what of motion pictures? Does this novel mean we'll be seeing less of Tom Hanks, the movie star? Is there a scenario where you think, oh, I'm going to basically stop acting, I'm just going to write? No, dear God, no. There is an aspect of how long you can actually, I think, do it and be part of the cultural zeitgeist. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. Where you become too familiar or the countenance becomes so overbearing. But there is nothing that is more fun. Coming to work and putting on clothes and pretending to be somebody else for a living, um, that's, that's a blast. Up next, 
an exclusive excerpt from our chat with the legendary Tom Hanks. Something you can only see right here on the CBS News Stream. Stay with us. Works in a world that is fraught with insecurities and moments. As promised, here's more from Ben Mankiewicz's chat with Tom Hanks about making movies and his very first novel. Have you walked out on a movie? I haven't walked out of a movie since <laughs> I was doing a play on Broadway and uh, a couple of times a week I'd go to uh, a theater uh, to catch their first showing of something and it's hilarious how often when you do that you're there with the same 12 other people. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, hey, you were here last week. <laughs> um, and uh, I, the, only, the only reason I left is because I was actually, I needed to go home and take a nap before my third. But I try not to walk out of yeah, it. I don't do either. There's a thing very early in the, in the novel about, like, that you can't hate a movie. Cannot hate a movie. And where does that come from? What is that about? I was talking to somebody about some film they just saw, and um, I said, oh, well, how is it? And uh, this, this is a boldface name. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, it was quite good. <laughs> and I said, what does that mean? He says, I, I don't want any sort of official record of being made by my displeasure with a film. And I've been in that position, mm -hmm. you know. I, I've ragged on movies and somebody has, you know, come Got back, back to me and said, like, hey, I knocked myself and I've been on the other side of that as well. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's, there's a way. Don't, don't hate a movie because they're just too hard to make. And uh, that it didn't work is just a couple of compass points either side of, uh, of uh, 360. So uh, any movie that I see, uh, I was with a very, very, very uncynical uh, major motion picture producer. And the worst he would say <clears throat> about a movie was, that didn't quite work, did it? Right, that's his, that was... And that is really, that's the way to, to talk about it. That's his no-star review. That's, that's his, oh, it was quite good. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, you know, every, we've all been in something that we thought was going to work out, and guess what? Did, didn't quite work. Yeah. Didn't quite work. Did uh, I think it was a New York Times piece, but uh, it relates to Charlie Wilson's War, which I... Uh, By the way, on Charlie Wilson's Award, yeah. one day, I won $5 Bucket Friday. What How is about that? What this is, is my, one of the great memories I have. What was, what's $5? $5, $5 bucket? bucket Friday is everybody puts five bucks. You sign your name to a $5 bill and stick it in the bucket. Mm -hmm. And then it's collected. And sometimes it's like 800 bucks in there, right? Sometimes. And at the end of the day, at the end of wrap on Friday, somebody reaches in, pulls it out. And it's always either a Teamster <laughs> <laughs> or one of the PAs, because a lot of, you know, yeah, a lot right. of people are And one day I, I took off and I was getting myself in. And all of a sudden, one of the PAs was not knocking on the door of my town, Tom, you won the $5 bucket day. And I jumped on a bike and ran it, and I split it with the PAs. But that's one that might have happened right on that sound. There's huge pressure if you're Tom Hanks and you win $800 in the $5 well, bucket. Well, they said, how do you feel, Tom? I said, I feel great because I love money. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and I've never won $5 bucket. In like 60 films, I never won $5 bucket. Yeah, but Tom Hanks can't walk off with 92 $5 no, bills. I, I, yeah, I right. did, you know, I, I, gave, I gave up half to, the, uh, to the, those who work hardest and are there the longest. But I did keep the other half. So is it... <laughs> I mean, you, you won. I won. I won. I won money. I put it in, right? Who gives that up? That's right. It's gambling, man. You got to take yeah. the winnings. Uh, what do you hope readers get? Out of this. Well, I think anybody who does something complicated for a living right. works in a world that is fraught with insecurities and in moment, uh, like anybody who, who makes a movie. A, there was a great book by a, a writer who's known as Rivet Head. It was essentially about working on an assembly line, an automobile assembly line. And at first glance, working in a factory building automobiles must be either a very easy thing to comprehend or boring as hell. But anybody who writes about the details and the struggles of how hard it is to get up in the morning and go off and do a job they either love or hate or feel lucky that they have or want to get out of, um, that's what I would want to, uh, anybody to get from, from reading a book. That at the end of the day, even something as glamorous and supposedly as familiar as making movies is just a long series of one damn thing after another. Up next, hungry? Well, just look to the stars.
Welcome back. The Michelin Guide has been rating restaurants for well over a hundred years. What started as a way to get more cars on the road has become a defining destination for restaurants, one that can put an eatery on the map and turn chefs into superstars. Califasane gets a taste of what it takes to earn a coveted star. So I know I could never cook this. Let's see if I could successfully eat this. <laughs> Even to an untrained palate. It has that like earthiness to it. This duck entree. Oh, and the crunch. Oh, I'm taking another bite. Go for it. Prepared by Mary Atia, executive chef at the Musket Room in New York, is... Really nice, and it really isn't like anything I've had before. With dishes like that... Now we're just gonna set the dish. Atia has earned tons of praise and one coveted title. Michelin starred chef. And that's something that'll follow you around forever. If I think too much about it, it gets a little <laughs> overwhelming, but it is something I'm really proud of. The Musket Room opened 10 years ago. It was awarded a Michelin star in 2014 and every year since. Atia took over in the kitchen in 2020. I felt like I had some big shoes to fill mm. to kind of maintain the standard that was here, but also impart my own vision on it. The Michelin Guide's restaurant reviewers, known as inspectors, took note. They said, uh, Mary Frances Atia is the master and commander of this restaurant. <laughs> is that the phrase you were expecting? It, it wasn't, but, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> the work of Kamari Mick, the executive pastry chef, was recognized, too. And they said that the desserts were thought-provoking. We were a bunch of nerds. <laughs> 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 yeah, we are. I wanted to have meaning and not just be random ingredients thrown together just because they sound cool. There should be or a mm. little bit of a story behind it. Well, congratulations again for the Michelin star. Gwendol Pulinek is the guide's international director at Michelin, known for its Michelin man and for the slogan, Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. Do you still sell tires? We do. But the one uh, making the tires are not the, the professional anonymous inspectors eating out in the restaurants every day. The Michelin Guide, first published in 1900, began awarding stars to restaurants in France about 100 years ago. The uh, founding brothers, Frère Michelin, had uh, this brilliant idea to have a guide to help uh, the people uh, travel. Today, international teams of inspectors review restaurants in countries around the world, including this one, with guides in Washington, California, New York, Chicago, and, as of last year, Florida. So the idea is while you're driving around on our car tires, here are some places you might stop for a meal. One star is uh, worth a stop, two star worth a detour, and three star worth a special journey. Restaurants often brag about having a Michelin star, or two or three. There are only about 140 three-star restaurants worldwide, but the inspectors who award them are strictly anonymous. We sat down with one on the condition that we not reveal his name or his face. What do your friends think you do for a living? They know I'm still in the industry, they just don't know what I do exactly. He says he has experience in hotel dining and a degree from culinary school. He's been a Michelin inspector for about 20 years. Have you ever been made? I have not, but I will say that having worked in the industry for so long, mm -hmm. I do run into people that I've worked with previously in restaurants. He says he tells them he's a consultant, but sometimes advanced spycraft is required. It's hard to keep that anonymity in this day and age, isn't it? It is. We use aliases. Mm -hmm. um, we change them up routinely. We use fake numbers. All for this the master and commander of this restaurant. Does that phrase sound familiar to you? It does, it does, yes. So are you allowed to reveal to us that you have eaten at Musket Room? I have. And what impressed you about the food there? It has a personality, something that makes that dish quite unique or special. Gwendol Pulinek says the guide is single-minded. The store is only about the quality of the food. It's not about the service and the setting. Michelin inspectors rate food based on specific criteria. The quality of the products, the mastery of cooking techniques, the harmony and balance in flavors, the personality uh, of the chef as expressed on the plate, and last but not least, the consistency, both over time and throughout their menu as a whole. Do inspectors usually dine alone when they're reviewing a restaurant? 
we send the inspectors in pairs or maybe more, but they can also, of course, uh, go alone. Mm -hmm. The mission guide decision and recommendation is never a one-man show to ensure the quality and the worldwide consistency of a restaurant's recommendations. Mary Atia says these stars are valuable. Having Michelin star maintains business. People seek out restaurants uh, with the honor. So, you know, we always try to keep an eye on anyone that might look like they're <laughs> inspecting a meal. Like many restaurants, Musket Room keeps photos of influential critics on the kitchen wall. Michelin inspectors are harder to spot. They could be anyone, and they could be anywhere, or almost anywhere. Have you eaten a hot dog from a cart? Yes, I did. You did? <laughs> How'd you like it? I think that's part of the New York experience as well. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a very polite <laughs> no-star for you. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.